It is really great, everyone, to be back again and to, to have you back. If you've been doing the lessons, it's great to have you back. If you're new, you're joining a fantastic community. It's great to have you if this is your very first time. Uh, this week, we're going to do a recap um, at the beginning of each session on some of the calculation skills that we've done. And then we're going to have a look at data and, and data handling. Um, today, we're looking at lots of different kinds of graphs and why they're used. Um, so we're going to have a look at graphs like this one. So, so this one is actually my heart rate on a run. So looking forward to, to having a look at uh, this. And also a contender for possibly the world's most accurate ever pie chart. So looking forward to it. It's going to make you think. Uh, you're going to enjoy it. Can't wait to get going. So on the previous video, we saw this amazing world record clapping effort, and we saw the world record being set as well um, by Brian. Um, and I just wanted to have a little little look back on this. I thought it was amazing. We we figured we could make an estimation based on this information of when he started clapping. Um, that in eight seconds he managed 107 claps, and and then we can kind of estimate what we need to do to work out about how many he must have managed in a minute. And I said, no one, I don't think, will get the exact right answer famous last words because of course I got this through now not only did we manage to predict the 804 claps exactly but we also had a method that I thought was interesting so here the calculation is we've got 107 claps in eight seconds so we've got a division which has worked out how many claps per second an incredible 13.375 claps in a second now multiply that by 60 seconds and we get to 804 claps so we did actually have someone who got that estimate bang on. Now, I also have to share, share this with you just because it made me laugh out loud when I got the, uh, the email and the follow up email. So this was one of the examples that someone had set. I was able to eat three pistachio nuts in 20 seconds. Can you guess how many I was able to, to eat in two minutes? So there I was thinking, well, three in 20 seconds, that's about nine, um, about 18. Uh, maybe we'll slow down. I thought maybe 15 or 16. Um, and then I had this reply, which I thought was fantastic. So the answer is seven pistachios in two minutes. I love pistachios, but you never know how long it will take to remove the shell. So, <laughs> Nate, that was a brilliant example. So we can't tell exactly, can we? Particularly when there's something that might change the uh, how smooth that multiplication is, the time it takes to remove the shell. Love that. Well done, Nate, and thank you. Um, now, as I promised, we're going to go back and we're going to go all the way back to the very, very first video that we that we did. Um, and I, we were looking at adding consecutive numbers there, five consecutive numbers, uh, three plus four plus five plus six plus seven, for example. And we saw that equals 25. And we actually saw that that is the same as multiplying the middle number, this five, by the number of numbers. So five, it's the same as five, lots of five. And we figured, well, why is that? To do this calculation, I could just, it's almost like I'm taking these two from the seven, I'm putting it on this three and, and this one, I'm putting it over here to make a more straightforward calculation, five, lots of five. Um, now, I wanted to see how can we apply that technique and go back to it, but apply it also to do some different calculations. So let's say 25 plus 27 plus 37 there. I could actually use multiplication to do that. You might just be thinking, I'll add the tens and I'll add the ones. Have a think about this. So if I show you this amount here, I think what I would actually do is I would do three lots of 25. And then I would just think, well, how much have I adjusted these two numbers? How much have I taken off them um, to, so that I've made them 25 to make them 25? So I've taken two off to make this a 25 and I've taken 12 off to make this a 37. So three 25 is 75. And then I just need to add on that 14 that I've taken away, 89. So that's another method that I could use to do that calculation. Now let's say this one, 19 plus 18 plus 17 plus 21. We, we might get lost in adding our 10s and adding our 1s. And of course, that's a strategy that we can use. I always think it's helpful to see it. Now for me, what I think I would do there is just 4 lots of 20. Um, and I'd think, well, how is this different from 4 lots of 20? Can picture this one filling this space here so there's almost like their two 20s and then I'll just think well how much less it'll be four less 76 so have a look at these three calculations here and what different ways can you find the answers and which do you think is the most straightforward way can you use multiplication for any of these questions and if so what would you do uh, pause the video and have a think about those ones 
Okay, and when you're ready, play again. And Now, there's lots of different things that could be done. I'm going to give you some suggestions here. Um, for, for the top left one, I, I actually did a four lots of 30. And then I just thought, well, how much will I need to subtract? Five. Um, so th three lots of 40 is 120, so 115. Um, so 36 times 37, I actually did double 35, which I know is 70. And then from there, I've got to think, well, that, that's one less than 35. That's two less. So in total, I've got three more to add on, 73. 47 plus 49 plus 54. I actually just did three lots of 50. And I thought, well, this four, I almost imagine three of that being adding on to the 47 and one of them adding on to the 49. And we get used to this idea of playing with numbers to make calculation more straightforward. So here's another example. 55 plus 55 plus 65 plus 75. Pause the video. What, what can you do to calculate the answer here? Can you think of any different ways? And if you're ready to play, let's have a look. Now, again, you, you could add up all the fives and add up all the tens and so on. Um, the method that I went for here is I did 60 times 4 to get to 240. Um, so there, that's 5 less than 60. That's 5 less. That's 5 more. So I imagine those as two 60s. If I take this 5 and add it onto this one, it's like another 60. And then I've just got this 10 more from the 70. So it must be another 10. So in total, 250. Well, I hope you found it really, really useful playing with numbers to calculate. But we're moving on to our unit on data, data handling. And today's title is which graph? We're going to have a look at lots of different kinds of graphs and think when it's appropriate to use one kind of graph and when you might use a different kind of graph and why that is, why we have so many different kinds. So let's say I, I could have a bar graph for the percentage of trains arriving late. That might be something that, I, that, that train companies have to investigate, how many of their trains are late. And this is a graph showing Leeds and Doncaster and York and Sheffield. Uh, and we can see there seems to be more trains arriving late in Sheffield. But this it's appropriate to have this information in a bar graph because there aren't any in-between values here. You, you, the trains are either leaving from Sheffield or York or Doncaster or Leeds here. There's not a kind of in-between station that's of any use. So we group the information by the stations here. Whereas sometimes we use line graphs. So here's a context where we, we'd see a line graph. So this is my heart rate during a run. Can you see these are the bits where I really tried hard and um, these little spikes in my run. And this was where my heart rate was at its highest, where I ran up a hill near to my house. I, my run was about half an hour long. Um, and you can see here that my heart rate changes slightly over time. And so a line graph is really useful for displaying that. That's an appropriate graph in this context. Let's say I was looking at a sports team and I was looking at the games that we've have been won and lost and drawn. I think I would show that in a pie chart. I could put them in a bar chart um, with a bar for one, bar for lost and a bar for drawn. Um, but I think I would use a pie chart and because I think the reason I would do that is pie charts are really good for making a comparison. So I can compare the sizes, if you like, of relatively speaking, how many games I win, lose or draw. Well, here must be the world's most accurate pie chart. The pie I have eaten here, the pie I have not eaten yet. Have a look at these examples here. Um, and so we've got temperature in a garden on the 1st of July, the number of different vegetables grown in a garden, rainfall per month in a garden, and favorite subject for a children in a class. And I want you to look at those examples and think, which kind of graph would you display this information in and why. Uh, pause the video, have a think about that. Okay, let's have a look. Temperature and garden on 1st of July. I think I, I'd probably show that in a line graph because the temperature, of course, will st steadily change. It'll probably increase through the day, particularly if it's a sunny day like we've been having recently. Um, number of different vegetables grown in a garden. There, I think that's most appropriate to be in a bar graph. So I can see how many, and you can see grouped by the different vegetables there. Carrots, beetroots, onions, and peas, for example. Now, rainfall per month in garden. It could be that it's a bar graph and we have 12 bars. Um, but I, I would like still using a line graph here. 
So this one shows for Seattle and for Chicago, um, the rainfall per month in a garden. And then I can see the trend that's happening, whether the rainfall is increasing or decreasing throughout throughout the uh, that, that time. Now, favorite subject for children in class? I went for a pie chart here, because I think this is a comparison of trying to see which subjects are more popular than others. So we can't see how many people were asked here, but we can look at which subjects were relatively more popular than others. Okay, so now we're gonna move on slightly and we're looking now at which graph again. So there's three headings here and there's three graphs, but which heading matches to which graph and how do you know? Now, of course, they're all line graphs here, but have a think about the headings and think which one would seem to be appropriate to which graph and why. Uh, pause the video, and see if you can explain why that is. Okay, let's have a look. Um, so, this is how they're linked. So the speed of a runner in a 100 meter race, in a 100 meter race, we start from still, then all of a sudden we've got to go really, really quickly. Um, and then we're at a, a higher speed. Now, a speed of a runner in a marathon race, um, the th this will be measured, depending on the speed of the runner, maybe over kind of four hours time. And the speed of a marathon runner, can you see it's slower than a, um, a runner in a 100 meter race? Um, at, at the kind of height of its speed and it'll be relatively steady and I would compare that to a speed of a runner in a hill race where that speed will be much more up and down um, depending on whether we're running uphill or downhill okay have a look at this example here so here we've got context where I might use a, a bar graph um, so have a look again and pause the video and which heading matches with which graph and how do you know Okay, I, I think you have to really think deeply about this one. I'm going to explain the how, how they're matched. So we have number of children in each class in a school. Well, we can see here how many classes there must be in this school. But the, the generally speaking, the bars will be around about the same size. It would tend to be the case. It'll be about the same number of children in each class. Whereas shoe size for children in, in year five and six, say, like this might be more in the middle because more children are likely to have a kind of average sized feet. There'll be a, some with smaller feet and some with larger feet, but then the, the norm, like more children would be kind of middle sized. Um, age of children in the year five and six class. Well, the giveaway here is that there are three bars only because children in a year five and six class are either nine, 10 or 11 years old. Whereas the favourite fruit for children in a year five and six class, well, that can vary quite randomly and there's no pattern as to which label I might give, whether this is apples or bananas or pears, but there, there isn't a pattern. I would have a pattern for shoe size because if I was labelling this, the shoe sizes would increase, but not here, which is why we, we have these randomly sized bars. So to find these tasks, click on that blue link that's just underneath the video, wherever you're viewing it from. Um, so for part A, draw lines to match the heading to the correct graph. So have a look, we've got all the headings on the left here, all the graphs on the right, but which heading matches to which graph and how do you know? Um, if you want to have a go at, at part B, so I think everyone will have a go at part A. But part B, um, see if you can match these headings here to the correct graph and how do you know which graph fits with which heading? And finally, part C, if, if you're still going, is true or false. So have a look at these two statements here. We've got graphs showing the speed of a cyclist and the distance traveled by a cyclist. And do you think that these statements here are true or are they false? And how do you know? Um, the answer at the bottom. And again, I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to be back and I'm going to see you then tomorrow.